everyone. I know um, we've had a long day of conferencing, chatting, so we'll try and make this conversation as inter interactive, interesting, and informal as possible. Uh, I'm Odrija. I am a senior research fellow at the University of Westminster, and uh, I work around sexual harassment in higher educational spaces and trying to think about an abolitionist understanding of higher education, especially in, within the context of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. But I am here today not to talk about my work. I am not here definitely as an expert in the topic. Uh, I'm here as a friend and comrade uh, to facilitate a conversation and to hear from Natasha. Uh, just a few quick things uh, before we begin. Firstly, thank you very much, Oli, for organizing this wonderful space and putting this together and bringing people from across the world together so that we can chat and have conversations and connect and build solidarities. We are very thankful. And thank you to all of you for your brilliant presentations. I'm sure all of us have learned so, so much uh, from each other in this space. Also a trigger warning, we will be talking about things uh, which might be triggering uh, to some of you. So if it is, please take care of yourselves. Uh, reach out to us if you need anything. Uh, as uh, some of you may know Natasha already, but uh, Natasha's case in India is still ongoing. Uh, so this panel will not be live streamed. It will be recorded. We will send it to Natasha to see if uh, she's okay with us putting it online. Uh, if there are parts that uh, she's not comfortable with, it'll be taken out and then it'll be put online uh, and made uh, publicly available. I think um, that's it, but also we wanted to do the recording and not live stream so that Natasha, you can speak a bit more freely as well. And there are definitely parts which can be edited out. Uh, Natasha, so you as well, if you want to take breaks in between, uh, and if you're tired of talking, let us know. We will take, we will break for five minutes and we'll come back. Okay. Sure. I in, in my head, I'm looking at you, but then I don't think I'm looking at you. Okay. But th because my screen is here. So it's very weird because okay. the camera is in front. So forgive me if I'm oh, like, yeah. if I'm a little lost. Oh, um, oh, but I would like to, at this point, introduce my friend and comrade, Natasha. Uh, Natasha Narwal is a doctoral student at the Center of Historical Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. She's also a student activist and a founding member of a feminist collective called Pinjra Tor. In uh, 2015, a group of women students from uh, across Delhi universities came together to form an autonomous women's collective called Pinjra Tor uh, to basically demand that the excuse of safety and security could no longer uh, be used to silence women within uh, university spaces uh, and curtail their rights to mobility and freedom. Their demands ranged from uh, eliminating curfews for women in hostel spaces, making hostels freely available and more affordable uh, for students, better lighting in university campuses, setting up of elected committees to dealing uh, with sexual harassment on campus. They consistently engaged with uh, issues of class, caste, religion, and spoke out about fee hikes in university. They spoke out about what was happening uh, in Kashmir, about policing and police brutality in um, in Northeast, they stood with sanitation workers who were on strike, and these were all feminist issues. I went to a couple of your Johnson Vice uh, in, in a time where we could all get together uh, and celebrate. It was probably one of the most joyous collective uh, of women that I have uh, had the pleasure of being in the company uh, of. Uh, but they also, at the same time, before the 2019 elections, got together to resist what was happening in India, particularly um, uh, stood against the, the, the current regime. So before the elections, they campaigned with songs and pamphlets in universities, on roads, in, in, in public transport, uh, speaking out against um, the intensifying violence against minority communities, exploitation of the working poor, uh, the systematically destroying of public education, of state welfare provisions, uh, dismantling of democratic institutions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
On May 23rd, 2020, Natasha was arrested and accused for inciting communal violence during the 2020 uh, Delhi pogrom. Uh, she was, however, targeted for leading peaceful protest opposing uh, the Religiously Discriminatory Citizen Citizenship Amendment Act, or CAA. She was charged with, uh, along with other students and activists, uh, with the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA. Uh, we've talked about this in some of our sessions, uh, which is a draconian colonial era anti-terrorist law. Uh, which, by the way, has striking similarities to the PCSC bill or the Police Crime and Sentencing Bill in the UK. And I will use my privileges as, as a chair to speak a little bit about it and solidarities around that at the end. Um, but on... Um, and, and one of the aspects of it, which we were talking about in the last panel as well, makes it almost impossible for people to get bail when you're charged with uh, laws like that. So on 15th, June 15, 2021, the Delhi High Court granted Natasha bail, and she was released from prison for, on 17th June um, last year. I actually wanted to play a video of the of the time when they were released from prison, but maybe we forgot to set it up. But it's okay. Um, I will. Shall I give it to you, Ali, the video, and we can post it on social media because again, it is one of uh, it's a video of hope when we saw Natasha and Devyangana and other comrades being released and they came out chanting slogans of, we will break cages and we will change the flow of history, long live the revolution. Uh, so Natasha, how are you? Uh, well, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. One second, Natasha, think. sorry, sorry. You are, we can't hear you very well. We have to increase the volume. Chal, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, is it better yeah. now? Yeah. Can everyone hear? Yes. Perfect. Even I can hear. Oh, no. I, I don't know how to, if I could. Uh, turn it away. No. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, no, I can still I, hear myself. You can still hear yourself. Okay, I can mute myself then. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> now I can't hear anything uh, from across this uh, stream, but yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I'm as okay as I, I don't know. I really don't know how to answer that. Uh, question because the kind of the times we are living in and with as you said all these cases and there are comrades friends still inside prison under these charges and you know I mean even if one has gotten bail and is now out in the what is called the free world which I also I'm putting quotes in this because it doesn't free it, feel free anymore uh, with I mean there are still these cases are going on and you have to keep going to courts and uh, almost every week and your life is just now just bound by you know being charged under a terror law and various other offenses so but yeah life is life is going on in some ways and uh, still i mean uh, trying to be part of the struggles and resistances which are uh, somehow managing to survive and uh, in the, under this regime. So, yeah, just, I guess, trying to go with whatever the flow is and with simultaneously trying to resist that flow and change that flow of history, as you said. <laughs> Though I don't know how successfully that is happening, but yeah, let's try. <laughs> Thanks, Natasha. Uh, I think the first question that we wanted to ask you was like in, you know, in the media, you were widely described as jailed activist and uh, to others, you might be classified as a political prisoner. And so just to start the conversation and also based on some of the conversations that we've been having here uh, is that what does the term political prisoner mean to you? Um, thanks, thanks for that question, Nadrija. Actually, I mean, 
it is something which i have been thinking about a lot since uh, you know my incarceration because before that yeah like you know the term political prisoner it was i mean when you would say or imagine a political prisoner the image which would come to the mind would be of like you know of course like uh, an activist mostly middle class or upper middle class who have been arrested and put in put behind bars for you know uh, participating in various movements and resistances and of course like uh, their incarceration would be just purely out of the state vindictiveness because they raise like you know dare to raise their voices against uh, the state and its policies or the kinds of repression that it unleashes on its citizens but uh, during the incarceration and after the incarceration actually I, this is something which uh, i've been trying to think a lot and it's still not like you know a settled question in my mind but what i felt was that you know we have been i mean the term first of all it also kind of reflects uh and i have been also reading uh, uh, about you know the origin of the term political prisoners and how in law and uh, by the state how that has at least in india how that has emerged and that kind of uh, emerged during the freedom struggle the anti colonial uh, freedom struggle uh, in india and initially that kind of separation was brought in by the state itself by the colonial state to kind of separate uh, these instigators from like you know the normal prisoners so that at least the prison discipline can be maintained so that they do not instigate the other common prisoners and uh, so that th that's why there should be a separate category and they should be kept separately in like you know separate wards and stuff but also it, the demand also did come from the prisoners themselves themselves you know to kind of distinguish themselves again from the common prisoners that oh we are not like so called criminals and we are uh, revolutionaries or dissidents and we should be allowed uh, you know we should be granted that status so i mean in one way yes i mean i, I don't i mean that distinction is there and there is a value of that distinction that but it kind of what in terms of the actual experience or the demands it kind of sometimes get translated into like you know this the now i that's what i'm trying to say now i'm not sure if i'm comfortable with this division this distinction of the political prisoners from like you know the other common prisoners who are presumed to be criminals right ki we are not like them we are you know i mean so of course for the kind of things you are in prison as a political prisoner are different and i think there is still merit in that distinction but i think in terms of the experience of incarceration itself that distinction i think we should we have to like rethink because ultimately it kind of uh kind of again you know in in a very warped way marginalizes the experiences of the majority of the population of prison which already come from marginalized backgrounds and maybe like you know for for example like if a woman is there who is a victim of domestic abuse and one day like you know she got fed up and hit her husband back and then she is in prison for that so how is that not also like you know how she also not a political prisoner in some way and why should that distinction be there when we demand rights for political prisoners or political prisoners should be treated in a certain way why should not that extend to you know uh, someone like that and that's what one realizes being inside i mean you we all know like you know the theoretically like you know prison margin, uh, like targets uh, i mean i'm sure in your in the conference as well this must have been spoken about that how incarceration like uh, works already on the marginalized communities and works in on marginalizing them further through incarceration so but by like this distinction 
you kind of leave out the prison population and the experience of marginalization and oppression of the majority of prisoners uh so i think that is something we all need to really rethink about and expand the definition of political prisoners and uh talk of, when we talk about prison rights it cannot be just from the uh, vantage point of political prisoners though of course there is some distinction and like it works kind of both ways like as a political prisoner you are also a kind of accorded certain privileges which you also want but then you only want for that for like you know a certain kind which is the idea of a political prisoner but not all prisoners which apart like i mean as a political to look at the prison system as you know as an institution what it does to people's lives uh um, so yeah i don't know if that answers <laughs> Yeah I mean I think I think you made some really important points there but also I think none of these questions that we are asking have any straightforward answers these are messy complicated questions yeah. that we are all trying to navigate in various different ways uh but I I I think these are really important points to make about like you know uh the the distinction between you know which bodies are criminalized in what ways but also thinking about the imperial legacies of some of these these laws that are being used in the current context to put uh political activists writers in prison and we've been talking about that in our sessions right you know laws like UAPA AFSPA that we that we were speaking about have like long legacy since the Rollat Act and before that in the 1800s and the early 1900s which were basically imperial laws specifically used to jail uh like you you were saying revolutionaries put them in prison so it's important to keep those uh legacies in mind uh since you brought up like uh the topic of like you know uh that which that you know incarceration works in a way to put the most marginalized in our society uh in prison and criminalize the most marginalized in our societies and in india it happens very much on the lines of caste and religion and class uh and gender um and i was just wondering if you wanted to go elaborate a little bit more on how um uh, you know these manifest in india largely but uh but yeah how 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 do these intersecting relationships of hierarchy uh, work within the larger context of uh incarceration and imprisonment um yeah so i mean i think i would like to begin with just quoting certain statistics uh particularly to india along these lines which i mean uh, there is this national national crime reporting bureau and they come out with their reports every year so according to the latest report i mean 67.5% of the prison population belongs to the scheduled castes scheduled tribes and other backward castes and 18.7% uh, are muslims which is much more in proportion to their uh, general share in population which is around 14.2% i mean so i mean just by these mere statistics one can see like you know who are the people who constitute the majority of prison population and uh, i mean this it is like you know this kind of perpetual cycle of criminalizing uh, people from these communities and then putting them in prison and then i mean and also that's and that's also kind of again gets linked to what i was saying you know why we need to expand maybe the category and the definitions of political prisoners because you know even in, and 75% of people are still under trials and in prisons and even within them the majority of people who constitute uh you know under trials or uh, they are people who have been sentenced to like what is called imprisonment up to like one or two years which means uh you know in legal terms what is called petty crimes or theft right and who are the people who would do that people who are already on the margins and do not have any other way of survival it's it's kind of you know their survival mechanism in the society 
and but they are the most vulnerable to incarceration so in a way that you know i mean they are being forced to do whatever they are doing because of the kind of society we live in which is based on inequality and you know oppression and then you they become criminals according to the law and then they form the majority of the prison population and once and also then once you are inside the prison what happens right uh so how do these uh different uh structures of oppression further get consolidated even inside prison which is supposed to treat all the prisoners equally right i mean once you enter the prison even as whatever from whatever section of society you come from at least according to the law you and it is supposed to be like okay now you are a prisoner who does not i mean be, being a prisoner being inside prison means that you do not have any rights as a citizen anymore and you're kind of even your human dignity and uh what you call human rights are supposed to be completely taken away from you even if not legally but that's how it happens that's how prisons operate that's the system of incarceration it is meant to make you feel less human right but apart from that like i would want to share like you know some uh, what i what i experienced in these 13 months i spent in prison and how to see how these structures still operate inside uh so one of the ways is like you know uh, labor right inside prison and because prisons actually do run on the labor of the prisoners most of the work i mean apart from the administrative work all the manual work of upkeep of the prisons be it like cooking be it cleaning uh you know like taking stuff from here and there everything whatever is required of managing of the prison or working actually functioning of the prison apart from like administrative stuff is done by the inmates and uh, so inside prison apart from like whatever space you are accorded and your basic food everything else you have to buy for yourself uh so be it like a soap toothbrush toothpaste your bucket like from those things to your clothing everything you have to get for yourself so then there are two ways of doing that either you come from families who can support you and then they will send you money inside so you can buy all these things for yourself and otherwise you have to find work inside prisons to and whatever meager wages you get you have to survive on that so i guess one can imagine who will be the people who will actually again end up working doing the labor inside prisons not the people who come from privileged backgrounds uh you know whose families can support them but again the people who are coming from these very backgrounds and then they have to work inside prison on like not even they are not even given minimum wages because they are prisoners so you are working on like even less than half of what are what are minimum wages mandated by law and from those wages then again there is a cut which is called the maintenance costs of the prison so you are kind of paying for your own income you cannot pay you know because the others who come from those uh, privileged backgrounds they don't have to work like i mean so they they are not paying the main maintenance cost the maintenance cost is also paid by the people who come from these backgrounds and then have to labor on less than minimum wages inside so it is it is like think about that is just and to experience that was just so mind boggling and then these are the also the people who would be in prison much longer because they are ki people coming from those backgrounds who cannot afford a lawyer like in the prison i was like it was a women's prison and i can tell i, I mean of course there is no, i didn't do an actual survey but around 80% of the women did not have a lawyer 
and that is the story across prisons anywhere between 70 to 80 percent people do not have the privilege to hire a lawyer and then they are dependent on the state legal services which is like a mess like it's a complete mess it's a miracle if someone gets bail through like the legal aid services so i mean then they are the people who also have to spend much more time inside prison and also have much higher chances of getting convicted because they do not have good legal representation and even after you become a convict so uh, your conviction also like you know is is uh, apart from the time you have to spend in prison there is also prescribed labor even in conviction and actually that is mandatory for from whatever classes you're coming in or whatever but if you have gotten convicted you have to perform a certain amount of labor but even that labor can be outsourced by like you know a, a person who has the means uh you know their families are rich or whatever they can send them money so then they will outsource that work to another prisoner who needs that money so they can even then avoid that labor uh so yeah i mean it uh, it just so these and of course the kind of treatment you will get inside prison from the authorities coming from like a middle class upper class caste background it will be very different from someone who you know comes from a uh, minority or you know who is a dalit who is poor the way they will be humiliated and treated as non humans will be very different from uh it's just yeah these things intersect in your everyday life inside prison in ways which is just uh completely like i mean you just think like where do you even begin to like unravel these things and of course like you know gender like uh so as women like i mean though like women do still form uh, a much lesser number of people who are incarcerated uh but the kind of discourse around women who are in prison is much harsher like you know you will find women very easily abandoned by their families once they find themselves inside prisons for whatever reasons and so and actually half of the women are inside prisons because of their families have put them there they have put the cases there either their family own families or in laws because you know as as i had given that example like a woman who was a victim of domestic abuse uh, if one day like fights back and something happens to the husband or whatever like the in-laws will file that case on her to like you know and like this is just one example but even if the case is, has not been put by the family themselves but for whatever reasons like uh, there was this young girl with us in our barrack who was like i think 17 or 18 years old and because she was in love with a muslim guy a family threw her out of the house and then she took to life of what is called petty theft petty crime to like survive and uh, so she got caught and she was there and uh, through like i mean hers was one of those miraculous cases from the state dear legal aid services after many months actually she managed to get bail but when you get when you secure bail for going out of the prison you have to provide an address to the court so that they can track that you have not run away or whatever and which is again like uh, you can imagine like a homeless person if they get incarcerated and even like manage to get bail they can't come out of prison because they can't provide an address so they will keep languishing inside <laughs> uh so that is another way that you know uh, the prison system keeps the marginalized people in uh, incarcerated and exploits their labor but the example i was giving so then when she finally secured bail and want like had to go out of prison she called her family members that can you please like you know uh, i'm giving the address and if the police comes can you please tell them that i do stay there and they refused and she could not go out for many many months and i don't know what all happened for her like she finally found someone who gave the address uh, as you know uh, and that was a person from prison who had 
find a secured bail went out and provided her own address to that girl so that she could come out so uh, yeah so for women it becomes even much more uh, harsher and the kind of gaze then that is of the society even after their incarceration is much more different much harsher rather than like you know i mean as to say like for men being criminal can be still understood you know that okay fine whatever it happens but as women your punishment even if not in terms of your uh, number of years you have to do but generally like the discourse around you the kind of hardships one will face post incarcerations are much harsher yeah thanks natasha it kind of goes completely against the brahmanical idea of how a woman is created the idea of a woman <laughs> yeah, is created yeah. more so in the current exactly. context of india uh, but yeah. you know that's the thing about what we what you were saying about like these cases where like their own mother in laws are putting these cases on them and like the statistics of like false complaint because i work around like sexual harassment people would be like oh what about false complaints that's the first question i very often yeah. get asked but the, one of the best things is to cite the example of india where like the fall, the majority of like whatever fa- false cases or whatever they are um are actually uh cases which haven't gone on trial because they they go in that category but also most of them are anti anti caste marriages or anti religious marriages where the families are putting these cases against people to kind of stop these marriages from from happening um yeah. it's kidnapping many, cases <laughs> exactly i have many many follow up questions uh but okay. i'm going to start with um the dehumanizing and the demoralizing aspects of prison that you were talking about because prisons are brutal and you know you were in prison in a time when like covid was at its peak like family visits were stopped you didn't have access to books uh but you also lost your dad in prison and uh and i i remember in an interview you said i'm going to quote that because can you can you hear me natasha your video is paused paused for a bit yeah no no yeah. i can hear you uh I'm going to read something that you said in an interview and you said since we were cut off uh, from the outside world and couldn't meet our families we ended up building intense friendships in prison we were in a ward where there were children many of them were born in prison uh, and it was heartening to see many of them being brought up collectively it was not that there were no conflicts or fights but there was also a sense of being together women were always braiding each other's hairs we played ludo which is a popular board game uh, together we learned so many ways of braiding hair um there is something so heartbreaking but also something so joyous about collectivity uh, in there um so i wanted to ask you because this is something that we've talked about at length is that if you could talk about some of these relationships that you formed in prison some of these women and children and their stories yeah <laughs> i mean that that kind of was the bedrock of these 13 months that i spent there so yeah i can actually talk and talk about these things and you will have to stop me <laughs> at some point so uh as i said i mean prison itself is an institution which you know which is meant to like completely dehumanize you and make you feel less human and you know just to make you feel that you do not have any rights or any control over your life anymore you know you do not have the autonomy over your life anymore from like when you will sleep to when you will wake up to what 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 can you wear what can you eat i mean it's everything is taken away from you and also prison i mean that's i was kind of thinking like you know prison is something which also seems kind of very pervasive in our society like can we as a society imagine prisons not being there no right like it's like oh how how will anything function if the prisons are not there so it's kind of very somehow uh, without realizing it becomes very central to how the society is supposed to function where like the good people are supposed to do this and the bad people are supposed to end up in prison uh so it's kind of very foundational to the way we are uh, imagined you know uh good and bad behavior or the ways of being in a society but 
we also end up not thinking about prisons at all in some way on in on the other hand like the discourse on prisons apart from like say whatever the abolish discourse which is mostly also more in the us but at least here in india even even in political circles even in activist circles we don't talk about prisons that much and uh, and apart from that those circles are still you could find something or the other but just generally as a society like i don't think i've ever heard anyone discussing prison or what happens in a prison so it's it's kind of like you know uh, something so foundational and yet so out of our minds that it it's kind of a blind spot and uh, so that's why like after our arrest and i literally had nothing to you know i mean i just couldn't imagine what the prison would be like what it what is it like and so i kind of remember the first day like uh, me and my friend devanna we got arrested together and uh, as we were admitted in the prison after all the checks and searches and stuff uh when when we finally entered the prison and we were being taken to the boards where uh, the prisoners are uh, the, the inmates stay there were like women who are like you know walking around someone is like filling water someone is like you know maybe some people are like playing or just sitting gossiping laughing and i just couldn't believe it i was like what what is happening how are people like seeming normal here like this is not i mean i didn't know what i imagined but this is not what i imagined and it was it was a shock and i'm not saying this to like kind of say that oh everything is normal inside of course it's it's a very brutal place as i said it is meant to de- dehumanize you completely but what i'm i think what i'm trying to say is that despite all that what i discovered was that people still manage to retain that manage to retain that humanity manage to retain that dignity somehow and the bedrock of that retaining of your humanity and your dignity is the relationships we form with each other inside prison i mean that's what like you know that people can sit together and have a laugh or sing or like even have a fight or whatever or cry on each other's shoulders i mean that was that was the most i mean yeah you realize that despite everything whatever they try and they try a lot <laughs> like it's not i mean uh to break you and also literally like you know there are i mean even in prison rules it is like oh prisoners should not be able to con- like you know get together too much or there are constantly they keep shifting your a uh, place of like you know your cell or barrack so that you don't actually get to form what they call unity <laughs> and, like you know revolt again, again or whatever they imagine but even just generally like you know if you if they see you talking to one person too much so then they'll come oh what is happening why are you talking to this person so much why is this person talking to this person so much this happens. so they try all kinds of those things but what i'm trying to say is like yeah despite all of that and and as you said i was uh, incarcerated in a period of the pandemic where even your normal uh, visits like you get with your family or your court productions where you kind of can get get to go out of the prison be go to a court meet your family members maybe there or get uh, like you know produced before a judge and you can tell them what's happening inside or you know phone calls or even just inside prison whatever activities were allowed before the pandemic was everything was just completely shut completely suspended and in fact for the first 14 days you were kept in complete isolation because of the pandemic but that is also the period where you need someone the most because you've just entered prison you don't know what 
it is like what you are supposed to do how is it supposed to function and that is those are your most vulnerable moments inside and you have to spend that locked inside one cell where you're not allowed to come out at all and uh, so that's what happened and i mean it was terrifying but at night like you know there was uh, the so the so isolation ward where we were at least you know we had the solace of from one cell you could see the other cell and another human being in that cell so people would just like even without being able to really see each other but they would talk talk cross walls and you know if you see someone like hear someone crying from some different corner of some cell someone would shout and try to console that person that you know it's okay it's going to be okay don't worry it will like you know pass or so i mean yeah so that's what i'm saying like despite everything the, these there are these very beautiful moments of people just somehow finding ways to connect to each other and form like relationships especially in the period of the pandemic where you have literally like no one else no contact from the outside world the kind of uh, i mean and as what you had quoted i'd said yes there are fights there there i mean but that is also a way of you know relating to each other expressing your emotions so i mean that's how and yeah that's how one really survives inside through like forming these beautiful relationships and friendships and i have so many stories about them but i think i'll uh, no tell us it. we actually <laughs> tell, tell us some of these stories like you know especially because i i remember us having the chat about the relationships that you formed especially with the children and you were talking yeah. about how much you miss them and the fact that yeah. uh, because of uh, regulations and the kind of your status you can't go back and see them now um uh, and and also the thing that like uh you know in 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 indian prison mothers even if they give birth in prison they can only be there with their children for the first 6 years and yeah, after yeah. that they are forcibly separated uh yeah. and and yeah so tell us some of these stories i mean i mean uh, whatever you want to share there is there is no yeah. pressure for you to share but if there is something that you would like like to share it would be yeah yeah as i said there are just so many stories i don't know from where to begin and where to end but uh, i'll try so yeah as you had mentioned i i did form a very very special relationship with the children there and uh, some of them were born inside prison and some of them had come with their mothers uh, so and as you already mentioned that uh, in indian prisons like the children can be with their mothers up to 6 years of age and after that they are separated so either they have to go back to if they have family members around to take care of them which mostly is not the case because again these especially uh, mothers are abandoned by their families so they have no option but to send their children in like some state run shelter homes where they can hardly like meet their children or see them on a regular basis i mean that is completely dependent again the on the authorities of those shelter homes and i mean because they also have so much uh so many children and so much other things to i guess uh manage that making the children meet their mothers on a regular basis is not one of their priorities so after like you know suddenly for the child who has spent all their that childhood inside prison and hardly has gone out and seen the world and suddenly they're separated from that environment from the mother and from their friends whatever whoever like you know they have been interacting with for the 6 years of their lives so suddenly a new space uh, where they don't know anyone where they can't meet their mother talk to them i mean it's it's brutal um and in fact like right now there is there, there is this girl who we were very fond of and she was also very fond of us and uh, she has been sent to one of these shelter homes and right now we are trying to first figure out which shelter home she has gone to because no even the mother has not been told where exactly she is so from that and but whatever interaction with the mother she has been able to have over phone calls she she is miserable so we are trying to like you know find some information about her and to put her in a shelter home where she can feel like secure and 
you know can get uh, quality care and education but uh, yeah apart from that so uh, coming back to the children who are inside and their relationship with the form uh, i mean yeah as i said we were in a ward where all the mothers with the children were kept and very soon like you know we became quite close to all the children there and our barrack which uh, thankfully the prison authorities did not manage to separate me and devanna and gulfisha who is also another comrade who is incarcerated under these charges for participating in the anti ac protest so we the three of us were together in the barrack along with other uh, inmates but so the children like very quickly made our barrack their unofficial crash uh, because again the crash was closed because of the pandemic and the mothers were more than happy they were because as mothers and as people who mostly had abandoned by their families they had to work inside prison doubly hard because they had to support themselves and the children uh, to from buying diapers from them to like you know special food for them fruits whatever like you know you can provide your child inside the prison i mean they would want to do that and so that they'll have to work doubly hard as anyone else so they would be busy throughout and then the children will just like come to us and be with us to like not 24/7 but whatever the uh, lock wherever uh, you know there are these timings which is the lock up time and when the locks are open so whatever were the open timings they spent with us and especially like i got really close to this uh, one kid uh, emmanuel whose mother is a uh, she is brazilian and she had come to india and got arrested and got convicted uh, and when she got arrested it was only after that she discovered that she was pregnant and so emmanuel uh, was born inside prison and because a mother uh, is a convict she does not even get to go outside to for court productions so he has literally not seen the outside of those walls of prisons and he's about to get, like this december he'll turn 4 and uh, and the mother does not know the language even english she can't speak so and it is now almost like 5 years for her that she has been in that prison without knowing anyone without any family support any lawyer not knowing the language just somehow working her way around to support herself and emmanuel and uh, so yeah i mean and for him especially like because her mother does not speak english or hindi and he is just a very confused kid who does not know what to speak how to speak and so he picks up words from everywhere and just weaves them together in some manner <laughs> and uh, and he got really re- like both i mean of course i also got really attached to him but he as well and as the lock our uh, barracks like the lock uh, opening timing in the morning is 6 am so the locks open at 6 am and by 6:30 or 7 he would be at the door and shouting my name until the time i would not open the door he would not go away so like i sometimes used to hide in the bathroom so that he can't see me. <laughs> but uh, and when the lock up timing would happen and they would have to be sent back to their own barracks they would just not go and they'll start crying and all the matrons will be like oh my god you have trained these kids to like you know <laughs> make us make our work of lock up difficult we know this is your call as like yeah yeah with the children also we are doing conspiracy here. <laughs> So, yeah, I remember the video. No, uh, not video. Sorry, if you're saying that you you were teaching them how to slogan, and yeah. <laughs> they would they would chant like little Azadi slogans. <laughs> yeah, and that. I mean, apart from that, like there were all these. Uh, I I was fortunate enough to be permitted to work in the prison library for a bit. so that was uh, that was a very enriching experience actually and uh, and then you realize that you know i mean there is such an urge to learn and uh, i mean also because 
when you're inside i mean uh, you, people also do uh, you know whatever the idea of uh, reformation however uh, like how dysfunctional that is i mean but people still want to use that their time in whatever is called a productive way and so there were these so many women especially young women who would want to like you know uh, spend their time in prison to like learn something new learn to get to read and write because as i said the majority of the prison population comes from backgrounds who have not had these kinds of opportunities so uh, so there were used to be these so many women and young girls who would come to the library come like you know there would be really like literally after my life that okay now give us something else even now we want to read this now we want to and as it's a prison prison library especially in a women's prison because again like that is again one of the ways that uh, gender comes in play that they would keep the library very very minimal basic uh that you of course like in a prison any library you will find it will not be very well stocked but still if you compare it to say the men's prisons and the libraries that would be there there is a very stark difference so uh, so yeah there will be just no books to give them and uh, i would then constantly write applications to the authorities that please you know provide these books in the library provide these books in the library and then after a while they got fed up and threw me out of my job <laughs> um i know we are um i want to leave some time for q and a um i was actually about to ask you like you know there must have been suspicion around like you being a political prisoner and and the circumstances you being arrested and what then were the relationship with the people in authority you know within the prison system but maybe that's something that we could pick up later on uh but i want to pick up on something that 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 you said you know and and of course like today we would have liked you to be here with us but you can't travel so in a yeah. process incarceration as we know doesn't end with the walls of the prison it continues long long after it continues with uh you know delayed court hearings it it continues with endless waiting lack of support uh you know uh with it affects families friends communities your solidarity circles um and i was just wondering if you could speak a bit about that uh it also actually i'm i'm going to use this opportunity to kind of uh just say a sentence about it also continues in the form of cancellation of phd's as we are seeing in 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 case of our other comrade safura whose uh, jamia milia uh, uh, her university has taken the opportunity of incarceration uh, to cancel her phd and she's fighting very very hard uh, and she requires our support there is a um, um, a statement on soas india society page which kind of talks about what's happening and how you can support her uh, there is also a list of email ids that you can write to so if you do want to please tell me and i'll pass it on to you because we cannot distribute that um, publicly because it's like the vice chancellor's email id etc people in authority so tell us and we will we will give you those email ids that you can write strongly worded emails to saying that please reinstate her immediately but sorry over to you natasha yeah no i mean uh, as you said and i think i had also indicated this earlier that yeah. it really like i mean it just changes its forms but once you are uh, arrested in act i mean of course as a uh, here as a polit like political prisoner arrested under certain kind of charges and under you know there is a certain kind of discourse but even as as i was saying for especially for women who are who get incarcerated under any circumstances like i mean even after you come out it is it is not over there is no freedom like as you uh, just gave the example of safura but uh, i would again like want to stress the examples of other common uh, prisoners even here like just day just a day before like we got a call from one of the uh, women who was inside when we were there and sometime last year she had 
come out after 13 years. Uh, of her husband and after 13 years the high court acquitted her and found that she's not guilty but she has already spent 13 years of her life inside and now after coming out of course her family is the one who put the case so they don't want her and she just does not know where to go and how to survive and she does not of course I mean has the skills to get a job or even if she does no one wants to give her a job no one like wants to talk to her. Uh, so, yeah, even, even that's what I'm saying, that's the extent, even after you have gotten acquitted, like the courts have said that you are not guilty of anything. And still your life is, just can never be the same again. And not just the same, I mean, you just still uh, seen as a criminal. And, uh, you will not get the kind of treatment who, whatever, I mean, as whatever, quote unquote, a normal person or someone who has not been charged with anything or has not gone to prison. Of course, like there are so many other uh, hierarchies and marginalizations which work on people's lives and stops them from realizing what they want to do in their lives. But incarceration is is a, a definite like stamp on your life which does not go away and for, and talking about my own experience of that I mean you know people like whoever I meet these days and they're like oh okay how's life going and you're like yeah I mean trying to get back to whatever is called the normal life but you realize there is no normal life anymore and uh, I have three cases on me so that means going to court around five to six times a month uh, which also means that going like in the morning to the court waiting for your turn and nothing really happens in these court hearings I mean it is mostly the trial has not started in any of the cases and it's just for attendance but it uh, but when you're there you also meet so many other people who are similarly just embroiled in so many cases and their life is now just this coming to court and um, you see like families of people who are incarcerated coming to these hearings breaking down some someone's health is breaking someone's like you know someone's children are seeing their fathers or mothers being taken away by the police and not being allowed to even touch their hands because that's not allowed and or like you know and they see their children or their parents like aging with every hearing their health deteriorating after every hearing but cannot they're not even allowed to like yeah just give them a hug or touch them in any way and even inside prison when these mulakats there is a glass wall separating. So you like that's that's the inhumanity of it that you're not allowed to touch anyone uh, outside, from the outside world, and it just breaks your heart to see that to see that um, every day. And there are, I mean, I'm saying I have three cases so I have to go to court like five six times a day, but. There are co-accused or people accused in various other cases from the Muslim community, from the Northeast Delhi where the violence happened. There are like people who have 10 cases on them. So that means like going to court 20 times <laughs> in a month. So they can't even hold a job if they even if they want to, even if they find some sympathetic employer. But if you have to go to court 20 times in a month, who's going to give you a job? So it, yeah, it just doesn't end with... Uh, yeah, coming out of prison. Yeah, I think that's a really important conversation also to have. I think Sharmila pointed that out in um, the last panel that we had just before your talk was to kind of think of how incarceration continues in the form of like families, in the form of surveillance, in the form of exactly this court hearing, in the form of like, you know, how it manifests through complexities of class and caste uh, and gender. Um, I think there is a... Um, 
there's a really good film made by uh, academic Uma Chakravarti about women in, in, in prison, where she interviews women political prisoners and uh, and they talk about uh, you know how how difficult it has been for them to come out of prison and uh, and yeah get back to what they what normal life normal life was. Uh, but also, uh, again, people like Safura, they have also produced a report on the police atrocities, which were particularly policing and incarceration uh, is and how they are being used against other activists uh, in the CA, following the CA and RC protests, particularly in Uttar Pradesh. And they have released a fact finding report. Um, and it's a really, really powerful report. Uh, if any of you want, again, access to that. Uh, let me know and I'll forward that. But on that note, I'm going to open it up to the audience. I'm going to take a few questions. Uh, Natasha, I'm going to filter the questions and I'm going to like, you know, uh, like read them out to you, but you don't have to answer all of them. Just feel free to pick and answer whatever you would like. Uh, I don't think you can see the audience. No, I no. I'll send you with everybody. If people don't mind, what I'll do is I'll take a photo of the audience. Is that OK? And I'll send it to Natasha on WhatsApp. So at least she has an idea of like what the room looks like and like give a face to the audience. <laughs> but yeah, just feel free to raise your hands and uh, ask questions, comments. Sharmila. Hi, Natasha. Hi, hi, Sharmila. Thank you so much. You know that, uh, while you suffered incarceration, um, at that very time, you petitioned the courts because it was the pandemic time, and it was an instance of racial abuse that you witnessed in jail. And, yeah. and jails are not pretty places, and you were lucky to get so much love and support but I don't think everybody does. And that was a very important instance because I think in in India, we don't recognize racial abuse in jails and that we have a fair number of African prisoners and they are treated very badly. So I wondered if you would like to talk about uh, the way in which, because we have been talking about how race and class can intersect in prison. And I was wondering if you could just throw some light on the experiential nature of that as you witnessed and which we had read off in the papers. But I had one very quick question on the just a factual matter. You talked about prison and labor, and you talked about how a lot of women are forced to labor to be able to earn, to be able to buy, because the state won't take care of you even while it takes over your body and your mind and whatever. But I thought, again, in, as far as the Indian prison laws are concerned, you only could be a convicted prisoner to be able to work. I did not know that under trial or pre-trial prisoners were allowed the option to work. I just had a question. OK, shall we take a few? And then yeah, Natasha yeah. can answer. Um, yeah. Anybody else? There's someone in front. Yeah, please raise your hands. Keep raising your hands so I can I can see you and I can, yeah. Hi, Natasha. Uh, my Hi. name is Sohela and I'm from South Africa. Uh, I it really resonated with me your description of how important uh, connection and community was within within prison. I work for South Africa's uh, Judicial Inspectorate for Correctional Services, so we uh, we try to to make sure that certain standards and human rights standards are upheld within our prisons. And very recently, we visited uh, a supermax prison in South Africa, where offenders are, as a matter of policy, essentially kept in solitary confinement for a minimum of three years at a time. Um, and you know, I was comparing visiting that prison to to the other prisons that we've inspected, which where where there isn't that solitary confinement. And though 
often those prisons are more overcrowded, the facilities are worse, uh, there is increased violence. It, In general, the inmates or the people in prisons they were were happier, were more well than those who were kept in solitary, just because, as you say, that connection is so important and and to some extent keeps you going and acts as a support structure when you when you are inside. I just wondered if you had encountered instances of solitary confinement being used as punishment or as policy for particular offenders, uh, and in particular, maybe in your case, for political prisoners, though, as you say, that category is is problematic in some ways. Um, and if so, if you if you could tell us about that, what, what your thoughts are, whether there was any resistance to that, or there is any resistance to that in in India. In South Africa, solitary confinement is technically illegal, but uh, is used nonetheless. Okay. Um, any other questions for now? Okay, we'll take one more and then you can you can start answering them. Natasha, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Natasha, it's David Lamy here. Um, I'm, I want to ask a slightly philosophical question. Um, so I hope this is appropriate. Um, we're living in an age of massive regression globally in the political sphere. Um, if you were a human rights activist traditionally, you would talk about an age of authoritarianism and an age of populism. Um, making it very hard in a term in a sense of a democratic um justice type space and clearly india um on a spectrum in terms of populism um and maybe authoritarianism is is at one end of that spectrum however when we think of prison what's interesting philosophically is it doesn't really matter whether you're in a democratic space, <laughs> a populist space, or an authoritarian space. All of them uh, uh, deny freedom. So I just wondered if you had a perspective on that sort of truth. Because in policy terms, it means that there's a hell of a lot to do in terms of prison reform, or indeed um, abolition. Uh, thank you, David. Okay, so uh, we have four questions. One around uh, racial abuse in prison, who can work, uh, solitary confinement and resistance to it. By the way, there are uh, amazing prison memoirs which kind of talk about that um, and uh, in India, especially because people who've been in prison in Bombay, in Nasik, they've, they've all been, like solitary confinement there specifically has been used and they're right a lot about that in their in their prison diaries and memoirs. Uh, so I can point point you towards some of that resource as well. Uh, and then the question that actually we were speaking about yesterday when we were on the phone, philosophically, what does freedom even mean in this in this context that we are? Over to you, Natasha. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're taking the first question first. Uh, thank you, Sharmila, for like bringing this up because uh, I had thought I'll talk about this, but somehow I uh, missed this while talking about uh, the various kinds of marginalization inside prisons. And yes, race is race is one of, of very significant factors. And as you said, that even in prisons, there are a lot of Africans, African nationals uh, incarcerated. And even in the women's uh, prison in Bihar, where I was, there were a significant number of African women and Latin American women incarcerated. But yeah, the African women were specifically targeted or like, you know, uh, viewed in a certain way, which was uh, both like very dehumanizing and degrading, but also, you know, with a kind of uh, fear, which is again, very, uh, you know, comes from viewing them as inherently violent and, uh, you know, that kind of discourse, which also invokes a certain degree of fear, but also is uh, not 
the fear the same fear of authority as such which you know as a prisoner you feel but uh, it comes from you know uh, this characterization of uh, the africans as inherently violent people which also plays in the kind of uh, disciplining uh, discourse around them that they will be like you know kind of uh, kept uh, as much as possible separately from other prisoners uh so so that you know they don't uh they don't again instigate or uh the other prisoners or form bonds or uh, with them that is seen as a big threat by the prison authorities and the incident you're mentioning and what i had also mentioned uh in a lot of places and even in the uh, uh court uh he had mentioned this that uh, what had happened was uh, as uh, that was the time of the pandemic and uh, because indian prisons are anyways way overcrowded like the occupancy rate is 150 more than 155% in the prison so one can imagine the kind of overcrowding there is and when the pandemic broke out uh, from the supreme court there was a uh, suomoto uh, guidelines issued to, for decongestion of prisons so that uh, and it was left to various uh, states and the high courts to form guidelines for those for that decongestion and so then there were these uh, various criteria formed uh, according to which people can be released from prison on an interim basis but uh, foreign nationals as a category were denied this right like as a category no matter what offense they are under they were just denied this uh humanitarian measure of getting out of prison in the time of a pandemic Up, along with like people who are charged under uap and other terror laws and uh, some other laws but they were as a category blanketly refused that relief and so some of the african women inside uh, prison were kind of holding a peaceful protest around that that you know uh, we are also humans we also deserve to get out of prison as anyone else uh, during this time and so when they were doing that then the prison authorities called like male police force from other prisons other male prisons which are around the uh, women's prison and uh, they just beat them up to black like i mean bones were broken uh, there was just blood all around me of course all of us were locked inside like we i mean could not actually witness anything but people who were there outside uh, did witness like i mean children witnessed that violence it was it was brutal like and then it was like not even confined to the people who were protesting i mean they would see any african woman and they would just beat beat them like brutally beat them break their bones skulls everything it was just like blood on the ground and and then they were not even given like proper treatment or anything they were just like uh nobody was taken to a proper uh, hospital and whatever bandages and stuff like they could do inside prison they did that and then they basically imposed a complete lockdown on everyone inside prison for 15 days like phone calls were not allowed nothing was being allowed even people were not being presented in courts saying there is no network or something like that so there was just no way you could tell anything to anyone outside the prison and when finally i got access to my lawyers i can i told them that this has happened and they filed something in the court to like uh ask for a status report from the prison and of course the prison authorities the kind of impunity and that's yeah that's one of the things which i also wanted to talk about the kind of impunity uh the prison authorities have it's it's just uh it's mind boggling that they can literally do anything to anyone inside the prison and even if there is a court order or whatever it just does not matter because there is just such low level of discourse around prisons uh and not just discourse i mean because the courts are anyways and you are as an under trial in judicial custody but 
the courts are anyways full of so many the pendency rate is like so high that the judges just do not have the time to look at like you know what is happening to a prisoner inside the prison especially if you are coming from a marginalized background and if you are an african woman or a latin american woman uh stuck in an indian prison i mean you are like literally have uh no way of getting anything uh, any justice or any uh, literally anything can happen to you inside prison and nobody would get to know about it uh so that's what happened and they, they completely like brushed that incident as like they were uh, the inmates were trying to attempt a jail break and that's why they had to use that kind of force and though like and a month later of, of that incident a, a woman an african woman died inside prison uh because of those injuries and because she was not provided with a uh, proper medical care but they could just show that as like a heart attack or something and uh, though a petition was filed for inquiry on her death and what happened but uh that after that like there is just been nothing done uh so yeah that uh, i mean <laughs> this is again a very big factor uh, how the incarceration works and i feel like as africans as latin americans or coming people coming from other developing countries and getting incarcerated in another country's prison is like even worse than uh, people i mean i don't want to like do a competition between marginalities but yeah having just literally no one to look out for you is and the uh, prison authorities can literally do anything to you you can and that's what happened with this woman jessica who died like just nothing and uh, people like there was this another uh woman from a latin american country who died in the pandemic uh and there is nobody to even claim her body like just so <laughs> i don't know it's uh yeah the question of labor i mean yeah as convicts you are man- like the labor gets mandatory like it's part of your of your sentence that you have to do a certain kind of labor inside prison but as under trials you're not it's not mandatory it's not required but it it kind kind of becomes mandatory because as i said people who coming from backgrounds where they have no other way of supporting themselves they have to find work in prison and i mean prison authorities also know that so uh they i mean it is still a competition not all people are actually able to find that work from the authorities because there is also a limited amount of uh whatever work that uh is available and there are already convicts doing that work and then as under trials there is a uh, very much uh, not everyone can uh do the work or get to do that any kind of work so it's it's uh so what people do is like then and that is another way of how caste and class operate inside among prisoners that a uh, prisoner who uh, lay, like say someone from my background who can like you know who has the resources of their families or friends supporting them and sending them money so another prisoner who cannot who then you know a person from this kind of privileged background middle class upper caste class background will hire uh, that prisoner to do their domestic chores inside prison so like i can hire someone to wash my clothes or uh, wash my dishes or make my bed or clean my whatever cell barrack so that is another way how it operates and uh, then i will of course will give them whatever uh they cannot demand a minimum wage there so it will be like some amount of uh, and you can't transact in money so like i'll buy some stuff like whatever is needed 
whatever she needs uh, from the canteen, the prison canteen, and give them that stuff. Um, so that is how also labor operates inside prison, even if you don't get to work officially inside. But yeah, as an under trial, it's not completely prohibited. Okay. Do you want to take the questions of freedom and uh, uh, solitary confinement, or we can move on uh, and get some more no, questions as well while you think about it? Yeah, actually, yeah. That will be okay, lovely. let's do that. Uh, we are also running out of time. Uh, so we will just do one very quick round of questions and we're going to try and keep it as brief as we can. Uh, we cannot go over too much. So any final questions, comments, thoughts? Hi, hi, Natasha. Sushant this side. Hi. And hi. Uh, hi. first hi. of all, thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution in whatever way you are doing, not from now, but I've been personally saying since 2017. So while first March happened, the over all night March happened in the Delhi University, like one year of the Pinjra Thor. So first of all, thank you so much for you and your group. The second thing I would like to ask, uh, uh, because I have a very limited understanding of prisons, because whenever I have yeah. visited, including the women's cell, I have visited either as a law student or the as an advocate, but okay. you have the better experience. So whenever we are talking about uh, that the prisoners in the jail, uh, prisoners in the prison in India, uh, one thing is is uh, agreeable by every word, everybody is that majority of them from the mi minority section and especially from the Dalits. So Dalits yeah. are the one who is in the majority in the jail, but unfortunately we have less heard of them. Like, for example, that we only think, for example, I have come across, I don't know how true it is, that the Dalits are not allowed to cook food in the jail because uh, untouchability, untouchability is practiced that if they are going to cook the food in the jail, the other prisoners will not eat. So the allocation of work is happening according to your caste. First thing is that, I don't know how true it is, but I got, got, it, got to know from some resourceful sources. And the second thing I would like to know from you that as a you being part of that uh, uh, sphere for for limited time period like th 13 months so how did you observe that what kind of casteism is happening inside the jail against the dalits uh, and uh, how it is problematic what kind of untouchability etc etc so if you could put some light on that i'll be grateful okay thank you so much okay so we have now uh, yeah, just how caste operates uh, within um, the prison system. Uh, any last questions, comments? Final call? No? Good. Okay. Over to you, Natasha. Okay. Uh, so I think I'll begin with this question of the caste because uh, I'll take some of this. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, as, as and has been pointed out, uh, that Dalits do form like majority of the prison population. Uh, and that in itself is like one of the ways where caste, oper caste and incarceration interact that, uh, you know, they are already seen as criminals and the bodies are already criminalized and then and also because caste and class also you know are so uh, <laughs> closely linked that uh, you are matlab, as a lower caste person as a dalit you are mostly most likely and especially the ones who are incarcerated you're most likely to also uh, economically uh, come from like an economically marginalized background as well. So and so inside, when you are when the people who end up laboring are then both like uh, coming from uh, Dalit OBC backgrounds and also not having the economic resources to support uh, themselves uh, from outside. So then and then they are the ones who end up doing the majority of the labor inside. 
the prisons anyway uh, and they're not being paid even the minimum wages but apart from uh, the this particular question of uh, as has been uh, pointed out that dalits not being appointed as cooks inside the prison i mean it is really not possible like i mean i'm not denying that there could be instances like this in certain prisons but because they form the majority of the prison population and majority of the convict convicts anyways so i mean there is literally no way that this can practically uh, happen uh, even if the prison authorities want and uh, so i'm not saying that there cannot let might not have been certain instances like that but at least what i saw practically and from the statistics themselves uh i don't think that is possible inside prison and i know of people coming from these backgrounds who were employed in the kitchen either and there are like different roles even inside the kitchen so maybe there something can be like who actually gets to cook the food but even there i know women from those backgrounds who were employed in the kitchen but i'm again i'm not saying that i can deny completely that uh, this kind of at least if not uh, practically implemented but certain instances might have happened where uh, people would have refused to employ uh, people from certain castes and apart from that did, what else did had you asked me sorry i'm, I'm no no don't apologize it's also like it's very late in india i mean it's it's pretty late here like you know it's after our working hours technically but it's like we are very thankful for to natasha for staying up like quite late to do this for us uh so we can find and, and yeah, freedom yeah, yeah and uh, yeah more, a little bit on the more of the caste uh, question was of course like apart from the question of labor like uh and again untouchability is really also not possible inside prisons because of the kind of overcrowding there is there is actually literally no space people have to like literally be stacked uh one after the other so but of course there it's not like the discourse is not there or you know uh, the especially among like upper caste upper class prisoners like they would often uh i like i can tell you this from the personal experience as well of other middle class upper caste class prisoners they would constantly like you know not even if they don't use the word it it comes from the discourse of untouchability which is uh, comes from caste structures that oh we oh my god we can't believe that you know we have to share our space with these kind of people who have been, who live like they're filthy they're not clean and uh, oh my god like you know we should like maybe write an application that all of us similar pe- people should be like kept together away from like you know these dirty people so and even some of the so called political prisoners unfortunately uh have this kind of and that's why i was saying that this kind of distinction between prisoners sometimes we need to uh, rethink about that uh i mean so so that what i'm trying to say is that even if it's not practically operationalized the discourse is very much there and even from the authorities side like you know we were also constantly told that as uh, because we were constantly petitioning either the courts or the prison authorities for like you know the rights of the prisoners whatever is like provided at least in the jail manual at least you know provide those things or facilities to the prisoners and we were also constantly told of course there was both kind like we were also seen as the trouble makers and that's why people should be kept away from us but apart from that like uh, certain uh, officials would tell us that uh, oh you don't know why are you fighting for these people they are habitual criminals you know they are dirty people you should not intermix with them so uh so there yeah, the discourse is very much there and in, inside prisons both among prisoners and like you know uh, from the authorities i i don't know if that kind of satisfies yeah i think that's also a very important point to you know to kind of make that in terms of like political prisoners that these 
like social divisions are even practiced by those people and in, in, in what ways and how that manifests uh, in ways not only from the authorities, but also from yeah. prisoners themselves and how that adds to the process of incarceration and violence uh, experienced by certain bodies within those contexts. So, uh, yeah, I think what we were, you know, one of the things to take away from it that none of these experiences are 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 simple. Uh, they are complex. They have layers to to understanding it. And um, and yeah, uh, do you have anything to add, Natasha, or should we close for the evening? Uh, I think I'll just try to touch upon the two other questions. Okay, please. Uh, so the question of solitary confinement, I mean, uh, of course, there is solitary confinement in India. And it is, again, mostly used on uh, people who are categorized as political prisoners. Uh, I was, uh, and people who were in the prison where I was, we were lucky enough to uh, not be. Though, as I said, like, because it was the time of the pandemic. So when you entered prison for 14 days, you were kept in isolation. So that was kind of solitary confinement. And it was it was quite hard, though at least you could see people around you. But yeah, it was so it is it is a form of torture. There is there is just no denying of that fact. But sometimes people also demand that for themselves because they face the threat of violence from other inmates. Like I know people who are uh, co-accused in my cases are, and especially the, who are in the men's prison where the while like you know uh, there is a lot of physical threat of physical violence so they have demanded that they should be kept separately from other prisoners so as as i just said all these experiences are so complex and it's it's very difficult to you know put them in uh, one way or the other but all said and done, of course, solitary confinement is quite, quite torturous. And it is mainly used as a way of torture and to break that connection, which kind of, as we were uh, discussing, that makes like really survive you, uh, makes you survive the period and of incarceration. So, I mean, I would have not, like, you know, I don't know if I would have been able to survive <laughs> inside uh, prison for those 13 months if I was kept uh, in like solitary confinement in the same way that I, I could because I had access to other people and forming those relationships and bonds with people around. And of course, that is also mediated through your social locations as uh, Sharmila was initially pointing out that you might have gotten that uh, you know, uh, those kind of love and uh, care around you. But of course, that is mediated through your social locations. But I would still say that, uh, as I was pointing out, the uh, example of that young girl, uh, you know, so she could go out of the prison because of another friend from prison uh, who was, you know, uh, so that is the kind of bond they formed inside prison. but she at least lucky enough to have an address to give. And she provided her own address to that woman to come out. And there are so many other examples of uh, such friendships and bonds being formed inside prison from people coming from, you know, uh, various kinds of marginalized backgrounds. And then that's how they kind of, you know, realize that, and especially people, women who have been abandoned by the families, they just have, those friendships and bonds to rely on even after they come out so uh, of course it is it is mediated through social locations but sometimes some things also cut across uh, those um, i mean they intersect with each other and people are able to like form and be in ways and uh, yeah, their last thing, uh, prisons and democracy. I mean, <laughs> that is that is a question for all of us to think, I, I think. And I, I, in the beginning, as I said, like it is in some ways so fundamental to our understanding of how society, our societies be democracy, be it authoritarian uh, states. But 
whatever like we cannot imagine the running of our societies without prison and that that is the question to think about and i think one i mean uh, i'm sure like in the conference uh, this must have been discussed but uh, i think i still find i i, I uh, go back and find the what angela davis has said about this very powerful and uh, in terms of understanding the functions of what uh, prisons serve in a society and and i think in this question i mean when we're thinking about that we should also not forget the be it like a democ- liberal democracy as we know it it is it is based on the capitalist structure right and the prisons as we know them today are a product of you know uh, how the system of capitalism has also developed so without i mean we cannot understand i mean just it's not enough i think to just say that, uh, how can be the pr- uh, prisons in a democracy but we also have to see that even liberal democracies are based on the capitalist system so and prisons serve an important function in that in that system so um, but what i was uh, the quote i was uh, going back to from angela davis i think i'll just end with that is when she says that the prison functions ideologically as an abstract site into which the undesirables are deposited relieving us of the responsibility of thinking about the real issues affli- afflicting those communities from which the prisoners are drawn in such disproportionate numbers so Thank you Natasha that was really powerful and I think that's what like Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes about as well like how like you know prisons are fundamental to understanding how race and capital comes together so if you have to understand society you have to understand prisons but also I actually want to end with something that we had a conversation about when we spoke when I asked you what does freedom mean and you said I don't know and I said that was powerful because do we know because we are te- we are technically you know pr- the word prisons are used to say well these are these people are not free but technically we are free in the society that we live today in the kind of surveillance that we have in the kind of uh, policing that we see around us are we free and what does then freedom mean to each one of us within that context uh, and i want to leave us kind of pondering on on you know thinking about more about on that note but uh, i will take advantage of my position as as chair and kind of just point one last thing out that like you know and, and we began by talking about like the the law that was specifically used to uh, imprison natasha and our comrades uapa they have long histories of you know they they have imperial and colonial histories they come from acts like the rollet act they come from uh, you know and they manifest in the in, in post colonial uh, uh, structures uh but also they also have uh, if you have to and and i know various uh, people here who've been campaigning against the policing and crime act and and surveillance and policing in the united kingdom and in order to understand how uh, and gargi actually uh, read empires end game highly recommended if you haven't uh, kind of talks about how these policing laws which are coming back in places like uk they have been tried and tested in the colonies they have long histories so if you need to understand these laws you need to go and understand these histories of colonialism these histories of how they have been used on people of color in racialized context but also if you want to learn how to resist these laws you have to look at histories of dissent that exist in large parts of the third world so if you stand against the policing and crime act and and walk on the streets of london and if you don't speak out against uapa that is you still used to put prison, people in prison political activists writers authors in prison in the third world you're replicating some of the same structures of violence uh, that you claim to stand against so uh, i'm going to end with that on the note of international solidarity 
in order to kind of think about policing, the global structures of policing and how they manifest in gendered, casteist, racialized structures, both in the global north and south, and how we can come together to fight that. Thank you very much uh, for coming this evening. Thank you very much, Natasha, for taking time out and sharing so many of your personal experiences. We are very, very grateful. And more than anything else, I want to reiterate what uh, Sharmila said before. Uh, that you give us hope and joy uh, that, well, I was about to say we will win. Get, 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 we will win. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Uh, the world is possible because if we can't dream, what's the point of anything that we do? <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Natasha. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. I'll send you a Thank picture you so of all of us here. But I don't know if you can hear, there is everyone's clapping. I can, I can. <laughs> And I would really like to thank you uh, and for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to share whatever I have been thinking about and the experience. And I hope that I was able to contribute to this very important con conversation about incarceration and how it operates and how the ways of resisting. Uh, and really, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> I'm sure I really hope that this audience agrees that your contribution has been invaluable in in this discourse so <laughs> thanks good night sleep well good night. Okay. <laughs>